All right, so um, we've got our project. I'm going to open up my scenes panel. And uh, the very last thing that we ended up doing was getting our hit detection for our, our rock working. Uh, one thing that might be useful to you if you notice, especially with the hit detection, is if you put your elements on different layers, then the order of them should work better. If you had both the, the window and the rock in its own layer, one might go behind the other. So simply by moving your objects to their own layers, you should be able to control which is on top of what. That's what I did. I moved the rock to its own layer. The window and the rest of the background is on its own layer there. The hit detection then of this scene was basically one object touching another object. If uh, we do a hit test, and uh, this object intersects with this object, the condition is true, and then we play the animation of the window, which then takes us to the hallway, or else nothing happens. There was no hit detection. And then we go to the hallway, so I believe this is where we left off. And um, I think for here, here's one of the things where we had a, a, a red herring in terms of there's something that is interactable here, but it doesn't really do anything. It's that, in my case, that painting on, on the wall. Uh, you'll be able to tap it a couple of times, and then eventually it falls down, and there's nothing there. But it could be set up that uh, there's an item back there, or another secret passageway, or something like that. Uh, we'll keep it simple. We'll just have it interactable, but then nothing, uh, nothing happens. So let's check. Do we have instance names? OK. Uh, no, we need to turn these into objects first. So the door to the left, the door to the right, and the painting will all need to be turned into objects. So you can make your selections. I'm going to select my door on the right first, F8. MC Hall Door Right. Again, the names of my objects and symbols are usually, or instance names and objects, are usually pretty verbose, pretty wordy. MC, it's a movie clip. This is related to the hall scene, so hall, and it's one of the doors, the door on the right. <clears throat> Registration on the center. That's an object now. And then, um, the object on the left. I'm going to select the left door. F8, that'll be MC Hall, door left. So then we also need the painting. Turn that into an object. Call that MC Hall Painting. You may have more than one painting throughout your project. So this is one of the reasons. It could easily be called MC Painting. But what if you have more than one painting? You could call it MC Painting 1, Painting 2, Painting 3. But by also using the prefix of Hall, well, I have, let's say, MC, I have a library scene, and in there is a painting. I would call the object MC Library Painting. So these can be named however you want, but thinking about the logic of them <coughs> with these names will help you figure out what, what object it is. OK, so that's a symbol. All of these, while we're here, we should give them instance names. Um, we can treat these as buttons, 
so my painting here btn hall painting instance name obj for object would be fine we used object when we had one object touch another object and these are just going to be buttons that you press so btn hall painting the door on the right would be btn hall door right and then the one on the left will be btn hall door left btn hall door left so the order of when you do this doesn't really matter but these need instance names then they need code so you can write the code add the instance name or add the instance name, then write the code. You'll notice I might have done one or the other. It just depends. I'm already in the code panel. I'll write the code. I'm on the canvas. I'll do it there first. Whatever. So let's open up our actions panel in the hall layer. The only thing that's there so far is a stop command. We need to set ourselves up with an event listener to wait for a tap. When that painting is tapped, then we run a function that does something. And the something will be um, a timeline in the painting itself. That it'll wiggle, it'll change, and then it eventually falls, plays a sound, etc. So we've got BTN Hall Painting. That's the name of our painting in the hallway, right? Dot add event listener. We need to wait for an event. And the event is going to be a touch event, specifically dot touch underscore tap, comma run the function, fn hall painting and then we need to define what does that function do so we list it over here Here's the part where I always forget to fill in the parentheses, so I'll go back right away. This is based on an event, specifically the touch event. This is completely standard. We've done this several times before. There's an object. We add an event listener, specifically waiting for a touch tap. Afterward, we run a function. Here's our function definition. OK, so similar to the front doorway, the doorway into the mansion, that one had an instance where you tap on the front door and it wiggles, but it doesn't actually open up. Well, that door was wiggling on the front of the house because we played its animation. We'll do the exact same thing here, but with different code. We're saying that the btn hall painting object dot play. Let's play the timeline of the painting's movie clip. We'll say play timeline of the painting. That's a note for ourselves that that will go over to our uh, MC Hall uh, painting object or symbol. So that's just our note that that's telling ourselves go look at the MC Hall painting symbol because it has a timeline and it has its own code and such. Um, this is. This will be related to when we have that other scene about did they open the door fast enough. Well, this will be 
keeping track of how many times have you have you touched the door if you touch uh, the painting if you touch the painting one time it'll move that's fine if a person tries it again then on the second time or third time that's when it'll fall so we have to keep track of how many times has a person interacted with an object so once we've got this part here let's um, double click our painting object on the stage so we can edit its timeline so there's my painting object double click it we're inside of the timeline of the object let's say on frame 5 of the painting object um, f6 there I want to do a couple of frames of animation of the painting moving when they tap on it. So I think with the quick transform, we can do an effect, I think like a little stretch out like that. You see there, if you use your quick transform, which is Q on the keyboard, and you select the the registration point, drag that registration point to where it's nailed to the wall. And if you pull that down a little bit, it'll look like the painting got pulled down a little bit off of the, from the nail. I'll go over a couple of frames, F6, change it up a little bit more again here, drag it down oops, from the top, drag it down a little bit more, and then also shrink it a little bit. So like this is a classic bit of animation in that you're tugging on an object and it's going to move, but it's also going to deform either thinner or thicker or taller, depending which way you pull it. So obviously this piece of paper right here, if I just pull it down, it pulls down. But a cartoon piece of paper is also going to stretch down a little bit and get a little thinner because the physics of it in, in, in its world is that you're pulling it down and it's getting smaller. So you see here my quick animation like that. It's going to pull down. Well, this of course is going to This is going to animate by itself. As soon as the person comes into this room, it's going to be moving itself, which we don't want. So as usual, we need to put a stop command in the first frame of this object's timeline so it doesn't automatically move. Until they tap it, then it plays. It'll play frame 1 to frame 8 or 7, and then it loops back to frame 1 and it stops. So create a new layer, call it Actions. Frame 1 of the Actions layer of the painting will add Stop. So this is so that the that little tug animation doesn't play automatically. Stop so tug animation of painting doesn't play automatically. Spell check on this automatically has two L's, two M's, two T's. We're so reliant on spell check nowadays, who knows? All right, so then after that stop there, okay, we need to keep a we need to keep track of how many times has a person interacted with this object. So we can use variables, which are ways to store data to keep track of something. So we'll say, keep track of the number of times a person interacted with this object. We're creating a variable. We'll call this 
MC Hall painting tug. How many times did we tug on this painting? How many times did we move it or tap it or touch it or whatever? Colon number. This is of type number. This variable can only hold numbers. We have zero. We have not uh, tugged on this painting yet. So it's set to zero. Okay, so you come into the hallway, no one's touched the painting yet, tug number is set to zero. They tap on the painting, because people are going to be curious, they're going to be tapping everywhere. They're going to tap on the painting, that number is going to increase by one. And then we're going to keep track. How many times have they clicked it? One, two, three, whatever number you want. When it reaches the threshold of the number that you want, then the painting falls and breaks or reveals another passageway or something. So that's going to happen after after they've um, clicked on it at least once. So we'll say frame 5 in the timeline of uh, actions, F7 right there. Because you see this is linear. They tap the painting. It'll play from frame 1 forward. It'll hit frame 5. Something will happen. It'll get to frame 7 and loop back to frame 1 and stop. That's the nature of it. Well, when the timeline passes by frame 5 of this layer, something will happen. It will increment that variable by 1. Then it will check, have we reached our threshold? If we haven't, OK, it just, just loops back to the beginning. They can try to tap again if they want. They tap it again. It, com it comes past number 5 again. It increments it one more time. It reaches the threshold. Something else happens. So in the actions on frame 5, here we will say MC Hall Painting, the name of the variable we created, tug, plus plus. We'll say a player has tapped the painting, so increment the counter, increment the variable. Whatever the name of the variable plus plus increments at one time. I believe we, we did that. Yeah, we did that with the Tap Frenzy game. Remember when you give yourself one point, it was simply the name of the score plus plus. Or if we wanted to be mean and take away points, we had minus minus. Just as a note here, because sometimes people want to do this. Um, let's see here, pro tip. Incrementing a counter by x. You have to write it in this way. MC Hall painting tug equal to MC Hall painting tug plus x. So if you want two counters, two increments at once, you write all of that plus 2. If you want it to be seven at a time for whatever reason, it's all of that plus seven. And this could itself be a variable. This itself could be a random number. Just like we created random numbers on the previous project, which we probably will add here as well, we could have a random number generator between, let's say, one and three. And based on that random number, um, we could add to the variable. But simply, the name of the variable plus plus adds 1. The name of the variable minus minus subtracts 1. But if you want to do anything besides 1 plus 1 minus 1, that's the syntax for that. It's commented out because I don't want both things to happen. So make sure you comment out both of those lines, or else it's going to add itself like plus 1 plus x, which is not defined, which will be an error. So make sure that's commented out. So we'll say after incrementing, incrementing, not incriminating, but after incrementing our uh, variable or our counter, check if we've reached the threshold. 
the threshold is how many uh, how many times do you tap on the painting before it falls probably two is fine um, with the beta testing that we've done for previous classes when the number was too high people uh, people say well I'm touching the painting it moves and didn't do anything what else is there to do uh, if you have it it seems to be if it's at two that's enough times about people saying well what happened there? let me t try that again they try it again then it falls so there are, of course, some people that figure out, well, if you tap this particular painting 99 times, something happens. Uh, but not everyone will take that much time. So we'll say here, using a conditional statement, we can check if the threshold is reached. And that's got the skeleton of if else if else checking threshold if we did reach the threshold then what happens in here is Painting was tapped enough. Or else we didn't reach the threshold, so the note is painting was not tapped enough. So what we're actually then checking inside of the if statement is, did we reach the threshold? So MC Hall painting tug is what's keeping track of checking that. So we'll say if MC Hall painting tug space greater than, so that's shift period, the greater than symbol. If MC Hall painting is greater than one, The painting was tapped enough, or else it wasn't. When the, when this scene begins, tug is set to zero. They tap the painting one time, tug becomes one. It'll check here. Is one greater than one? Well, let's start this way. Is zero greater than one? Yes or no? No. 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 Is one greater than one? Yes or no? No. No. One is equal to one. Is two greater than one? Yes. So once the painting has been tapped two or more times, then this first part here kicks in. If it's anything besides being more than one, this else part will kick in. And we haven't created it yet, but what will further happen here is more animation, more of the timeline will play. We've got that in the first in my case, seven frames. These are the frames regarding well, the, the animation of it being pulled from the wall. Eventually, uh, then I need animation of it actually falling and breaking on the ground. So let's say we'll start on frame, we'll do that on frame 10. So our code here will be uh, that we'll have go to and play 10. So painting was tapped enough. So play the object's timeline at frame 10. Frame 10 is where we'll, we will draw some animation of it being broken.
there is no frame 10 yet, so this will of course cause a problem if you try to play it. But you see the idea is, once they've tapped the painting enough times, play the animation at frame 10. We'll do a little animation of it falling and breaking, starting on frame 10. So in frame 10, I'll press, um, press F6. That'll copy the previous frame. I will then get a little creative. I'll move it down a little bit. I'll start to redraw this in terms of uh, actually I see here I'm gonna leave I'm gonna leave the nail in the in the wall but then we'll move down the painting Something like this. I'm redrawing it a little bit. So it's up on the wall. I'm bringing it down a little bit. I've got the the string breaking a bit. I'll jump over two frames, F6. Further move it down. Maybe also change it up a little bit. So the painting's up on the wall, it falls a little bit, falls further down. The further you move the object, the, the illusion is the faster it falls. So if you only move it a couple pixels down, you're going to have to draw a lot of, you're going to have to add a lot of frames to make it travel all the way down to the ground. If instead you actually move the object on screen several pixels, it moves like, it looks like it moves really fast, it fell really fast. So if it starts over here, and then it jumps down here, and then down to here, and then on my next frame, I don't have to draw it you know, frame by frame hitting the actual floor. The next shot will be maybe just already of it on the ground. So wherever the ground is, and I'll rotate it. rotate it and grab a piece of it and I'll draw it like it's all broken pieces on the ground. So this will be the part where you can get pretty creative. But in my case, it looks like that. The more frames that you add, the more realistic it looks. In my case, I think that's enough frames, enough changing that it does 
look like it'll it falls and breaks. Then with the sound effect, it'll be even better. So I'll give you a moment to draw that. We need to then add code so that it doesn't loop, so that it doesn't break on the ground and come back to the beginning. So let me let you finish drawing your broken painting. Then we'll add some action script to stop it and then also deal with with one more code related concept. Okay, so the concept here of what we need to do is after the painting falls and it hits the floor, uh, it's going to loop unless we tell it to stop. So on your final frame, in my case uh, frame 14, I'll add a new blank keyframe F7 and then in the action script code, I'll add a stop command. So this symbol is visible on frame one on the wall undisturbed. They tap it, it'll then jump over to the frame, um, it'll then play and jump over to these frames five, six, seven and play an animation of it being tugged um, which will then need a loop in a moment and after it's tugged enough times, it'll jump to frame 10, where it then plays the animation of it breaking and stops on frame 14. Well, in between these frames right here, these are the frames, 5 to 7 or so, these are the frames of it being tugged on. After that gets tugged, I want it to go back to a normal position. So we'll need another um, action script frame. Uh, we'll do it on frame 9. So F7 on frame 9. Because clicking on the painting will play frames 1 through 9 and loop back so that the painting looks normal. In case they want to tap it again, it'll play, loop back. So on frame nine we'll have go to and stop frame two now it would make sense to go back to frame one but we don't want to go back to frame one because frame one is where we start to initialize the the object so we would reset our count of how many times we've tapped the object so every time the playhead goes to a particular frame, it does what it says. And on frame one, it says, set the number of times we've hit the painting to zero. So we don't want to loop back to that. It'll reset our number every time back to zero. That's why frame nine is jumping us to frame two. There's no command in frame two to restart. Frame five then increments the number, checks if we've reached threshold, if we didn't, it'll keep playing, it'll jump to frame 9, and then jump us back to frame 2. If we do hit the threshold on frame 5, then it'll jump us to frame 10. It'll animate and take us to frame 14 where it stops. The last thing to get this painting to work is that 
after the painting breaks. This is on frame 14. This is on frame 14 after, uh, after the painting breaks. So after the painting breaks, deactivate the event listener. So a person doesn't keep trying to tap the broken painting. They've already interacted with it uh, up to our up to our goal. Our goal is they tap it one time, they see something happens. They tap it again, they break it. Well, we're done with that. We could make it do more, but we're going to be done with that in terms of, okay, they broke it, it's on the ground, that's it. You can't tap it anymore, nothing else will happen. We could further add more animation that once they keep tapping it, even if it's broken, okay, then whoops, they get cut, and now there's, now there's blood on the floor. I don't know, whatever you want to do with that. But uh, here we'll say we will stop paying attention to uh, letting that painting get tapped. the way we do this. We need an event listener, but it's going to be written in a slightly different way. Movie clip. This dot root dot the name of our painting instance. MC hall, no, what is it? BTN hall painting dot remove event listener. So we always had, up until this point, the name of the object dot add event listener. So we're saying, let's pay attention to this object to get tapped to do something. Now we need to turn off the event listener. Stop paying attention to this object. It's no longer a clickable thing. We should not interact with it anymore. So the big idea is remove event listener. But we have to then say this first part over here. Uh, because right now we're in the timeline of this of this object. Um, saying movie clip this root is like the main timeline, the root level, the topmost level of the of the game. From the top root level, you will find the BTN Hall painting, and then we'll remove its event listener. Well, like before, this also needs to be based on a touch event specifically touch tap and it needs to then deactivate the specific function we were using before the same one as before which I believe is FN hall painting let me confirm that right here and just double check yeah FN Hall Painting. Actually, we need to do it also before FN Hall Painting. This is saying uh, there's a function in this timeline called Fall Painting or Hall Painting, but actually it's on the main timeline. So we need the movie clip this route again. So movie clip dot function Hall Painting, and inside the parentheses we've got the this dot root. So this is the more complete thing. Uh, movie, movie clip root is saying from the main timeline dot you will then find the function hall painting. believe at this point finally we've got enough that we can start to test it um, go ahead and try to test it on your device see if you get any any errors we'll fix that if we do let me check mine uh, no errors there okay so let's uh, check your project double check those spelling mistakes if it's not quite working raise your hand we'll come over to help you 
I'll ch confirm it on mine. Oh, we'll be there right there in a moment, Marco. Let me just uh, confirm my code works, and then we'll be there one moment. Let's see. So on my device, I play, open the gate, throw the rock. I'm in the hallway, tap the painting, gets tugged, cool, tap it again, oops, broke. So it is doing what I want. Oh, I try to tap the painting again, nothing should happen. If if we didn't do this final remove event listener, the whole the, the painting would fly back onto the wall and loop again if we didn't do that final remove listener. So that should that's how that should be working. Anyone little need a little help? Didn't quite work. Okay, here's my code so far, I think, and we'll check.
This one, McCall painting frame one.
nothing there. Uh, you, if you would like, could then have something else happen with it being on the ground or behind the scene. Maybe something is revealed. Again, that would be a little bit of the extra effort of having the painting on its own layer with something else in its own layer behind it in that order. But in my case, it's just going to be the painting falls down. Cool sound effect later. Let's set ourselves up if we go to the right scene. That's the one that is a complete dead end. Literally, literally, you will be dead if you go to the right. So um, we'll go to the right. We'll go to that scene. We'll have something happening there on a pseudo timer. After a certain amount of time passes, then it, uh, you're automatically dead. So that's good. Sorry, yes. Uh, What's that? Uh, please go back to action screen 14. Sorry. Yes, 14. Yes. Uh, yeah, anything else? Oh, no, oh, it was um, because I was showing um, frame one to Matthew. All right. Yes, I was going to go to the right spot in one moment. So after the, um, the painting does its thing, it falls down, and... Um, from the hall, we're going to tap to go to the right, and then to the right will be hallway to the right, right there. Well, uh, we need the event listener in the hallway right here to wait for that paint, uh, for that door to be touched. I'm not going to do anything fancy here. You're going to tap the door, and it will move automatically. Based on we, what we've already done, if you would like to, you can animate the door opening up, moving to the right. I'm just simply going to have it tap that. We go to the scene to the right. So that's got an object or instance name that is. So in our actions panel of the hallway, we need to set up something exactly the same as we've done before. We need an event listener with a function then that, that runs after the trigger. So we're going to get triggered right here. btn hall door right dot add event listener. As usual, this will be a touch event. Capital T, capital E, dot touch tap. Comma FN go. Um, what are we naming these things? Go hall right. Go start, go hall right. Yeah, that'll work. So um, go hall right. Now, of course, you may have more than one hall that you're going through. Um, earlier today, I did put the requirements of what the final project will be. It's, has a, it, has, it has a minimum number of scenes and such. If you're able to get the code working as we're working with, you have the minimum number. If you'd like to do more scenes, more twists and turns, of course, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but then you'll have to think about how you name your things here. So fn go hall right. We need to then define the function of what go hall right is. This is based on an event of touch event. And super simple. We just go. We just do the usual. Go to the other scene. Movie clip, parentheses, this root, dot go to and play, quotes, or parentheses, what frame number, one, comma, 
uh, what specific scene number, in my case, uh, S3 Hall Right. So move us to the other completely different scene. If the person taps the, the door to the right, we move to the right. While we're here to save ourselves, ourselves some effort, let's make the event listener and the event handler function to go left. So you can copy all of this that you wrote if you wrote it correctly. Paste it and then just change the little details. btn hall le uh, door left dot add event listener function go hall left define the function go hall left movie clip root go to and play scene three hall left So copy and paste that for your right and your left. Make sure you change all instances of the copy to say left as necessary. So now we've got it all set up for the left and the right directions. We will do the right hallway first because that's going to be pretty easy. It's going to be very insidious. A person goes to the right. There, there will be things there, paintings and doors and stuff that they could interact with. I won't set it up at the moment during the lecture. You could. You could set up that tapping that painting looks like something's going to happen, or trying to grab that door looks like it's going to happen. But no, if a person goes to the right, there will be no way to get past that they, they will die. And we're not setting up any way to go back. You should be able to set up a way to go back based on everything we've done so far. Thinking one step outside the box of what we've done, you should be able to make it to go back to go forward throughout the house. Right now it's going to be very linear. So we'll go to the right hallway. We'll go to scene three, hall right. There's a hallway here. Nothing is white, nothing is clickable. Um, you could set it up if you want. What's going to happen here, however, is on its own layer, I'm going to create a, a creature. So new layer, creature. And I'm going to use some amount of frames, which will be some amount of time, for the creature to come at us. So nothing fancy. We don't need a timer or anything. It's just going to be the linear timeline of the project in the number of frames and time that we have here. Maybe <coughs> four seconds. We can easily cut this how we want. Let's say four seconds, frame 96. I want to extend my layer 1, my background layer. It might be a good idea to call that background just to keep track of it. My background layer, I want it visible for four seconds. So um, F5 on frame six to extend the background all the way there. On the creature layer, I've, that's a layer so that then I can uh, draw a creature and animate it that it's far away and coming at us. So it's going to scale from a small size to a big size, looking like it's coming at us. So uh, here, we'll draw some sort of creature. So I'm going to start it off uh, small. That's on its own. That's on its own layer. You can draw it as complex as you want a little later. For the moment, I'm just uh, making some sort of creature here. 
turning it into a symbol. It's not going to be clickable, it's not really going to be interactive, but if we turn it into a symbol now, we could make it interactive later, such as adding sound. Maybe you're tapping on the creature trying to battle it off and it makes some sound, but it's not going to work. So here, uh, MC hallway right creature. Hall right creature. That's a symbol, and the main thing I wanted that for is just to be able to animate it. I guess with a with a um, with a motion tween that that'll be fine. So for frame um, ninety six of the creature layer F five, and then in between, right click, create motion tween. What I want it to do is on the final frame, I want it to be larger. And move it somewhere. It's going to come down the hall like that. Since it's, in, uh, since it's a symbol, we'll also animate its mouth moving or something in a moment. Uh, or maybe it's got tendrils and they move or whatever. But here's a, a, uh, a, a simple um, motion tween so that you can do a little bit of perspective in that it is small and then grows because it comes at you. And after an, an X amount of time, which in my case is 96 frames, which is 4 seconds, after four seconds of them trying to tap that door, trap that painting, nothing's happening, I can't go back, I'm petrified with fear, it gets me, and then it'll take me to my uh, S for ending bad. So before we do that, maybe we can have a little fun by animating the, 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 the creature a little bit. So because it is a, a, an object that has been turned into a symbol, we can uh, double-click it to edit it. And just animate it somehow. Um, maybe redrawing the face a little bit, or the eyes are filling in colors or something. So I'm going to also resize some of its features, some of the eyes and things. So depending how many frames you use, it could be moving a lot or a little, pulsating or something.
So that's the creature. It's going to. You're, you're not going to see it previewed here when you when you play that scene simply like that by pressing enter. You won't see it actually animating and such. When it plays on the actual device, then you will see it. Well, the point is, once it reaches the end, frame 96, it is the end for you, the player. So we'll need some code on frame 96 that then takes us to the bad ending. That means, let's see, we've got a stop command on frame 1 of the actions layer, which we don't want because we want it to to do this animation. Once the they click to go to the right, it's go to and play, scene, right hallway. I don't want that stop command on frame 1, but here's a little trick. You can uh, click to select a frame and then I want that frame actually at the end. So I'm going to drag it to the end. So you can drag the frame with the accompanying code. And the trick is you need to click it to select it. Don't, don't click and drag, then that's a selection. You want to click one time to select frame one of the hall right layer, and then drag it to the end. So at that point, the frame the the frame stop right here now we have a stop here first because if we didn't have a stop it might automatically go to my next scene which in my case would be uh, the hall left so we're saying let this thing animate then it stops and then it'll take us to the next scene now just to be careful here with everyone I'm back on the hall I'm not inside of the the, the creature there's gonna be no code in the timeline of the creature. This is happening in the in the hallway timeline. And after this scene stops here, then we'll do the usual to move us to the bad ending. Which is movie clip. We'll say, okay, after four seconds, which is 96 frames, go to the bad ending. Movie clip dot go to and play. This dot root from the main timeline, we will go to and play a particular frame with a particular scene name. Quotes, don't forget quotes on that. And that is S for ending bad. So that's the idea there. The creature's going to come at us. There's four seconds of panic. It's going to be animating. We'll have sound with it later. Once it gets to the 96th frame, this timeline stops, and then it takes us over to ending bad. And we haven't done anything on this frame yet, so or this scene, so we'll set this up, of course, to replay or quit in a moment. Let's confirm this one's working. So, hallway right. Uh, that's all that happens on this one. We should be able to save it and test it. Should you make the door in the picture clickable just to make them have a little bit of hope? Uh, I won't, but you could. 
That way they can think that they'll be able to escape, but yeah. You make those into symbols, you give them event listeners, and then you do what we've done so far to make it look like it's about to open. Maybe you can have the door open halfway, and then there's like a little chain. You know how you can put a chain in a door from the inside? It looks like it's opening, but there's a chain. Maybe you tap on the painting, and then the, the face on the painting changes, like it's laughing at you or something. There's lots of things to do. So here's mine. Load it up. Now at a certain point, the more complex you make it, you will have to go through your own game, of course. Uh, so, okay, go through the gate, throw the rock, okay, I'm there, play with the painting if you want, I guess, go to the right, go to the right, oh, it's coming out, I'm going to open the door, nothing there, nothing there, it's coming, I'm terrified in terror, and then I'm dead. Play and replay, or quit and replay don't work just yet, but I'm at the lose screen. So, let's pause right there. Anyone need a little help? Did your code work up to that point? Go to the next page. Oh, let's check. So, there's our code so far. Nothing happened. Uh, got slimed. Okay, well, let's look at your uh, code right there. This report was correct. Let's confirm that I have your sequence the end there. Let's put it in there. Can you double click where you're ending that? Well, it's the mouth. Copy that. Copy that. Action. Action. Just to confirm, let's go back to the hallway to the right. We paste it in. Seems to be the same. This really cool. Who you the Jato? Thank you. 
Okay, so um, that takes us to our bad ending. Uh, let's work on the bad ending in that there we have the option of playing again uh, or quitting everything, uh, exiting the game. Rage quitting because we died too many times. So um, we can program both of those to shut the game off or to restart. So uh, over on our scene four ending bad, we need to turn the replay and the quit button into symbols and then add event listeners and then just do some simple movement back to the first to the beginning or to exit now here's another instance where if you want to be fun you could make other things on the screen also clickable you can click on the tombstone and something happens either consequential or not maybe just click on it and the tombstone falls over that's it or you click on something enough times and then your hand comes out of the grave or something. Plenty of things to do. But at the, at the minimum here, let's turn these objects into symbols. The replay button, so that'll be MC replay BTN. Or yeah, MC replay, uh, just MC replay, that's fine. Now, MC replay BTN. We know that it'll be a button, so might as well put button in the, in the name of it. And then the quit one will be MC quit BTN. They need instance name, so here's one we'll say BTN quit versus BTN replay. Replay, not reply. Okay, so for our for our code, uh, I've got an actions layer. You open up your actions. We have a stop so far. We need to set up the event listener. When you uh, click that, let's do the let's do the quit button first. So the way that works, btn quit dot add event listener. on the touch event, on the instance of a touch event, dot touch tap comma fn quit game. We're going to define quitting the game. We 
when the event of a touch event happens. So what's happening inside of this function is uh, run the code to quit the game on the device, returning to home screen. So this is getting us outside of the game. As long as the game is running, we're inside of the world of the game and its rules and so forth. And then after we write this code right here, it'll then take us out of the game. It'll shut itself off, remove itself from memory. And then we're back on our device. So we have here then the command native application, capital N, capital A, dot native application, lowercase n, capital A, dot exit, parentheses. So there's a variety of native application type of uh, commands. And that, that's like tapping into the deep level of the device. So tapping into the ability to interact with the device because we've got a power button, volume buttons, we've got a camera, sensors. If In theory, we could write code that taps into the camera of the device. You take a photo of the player and it's their photo in the game. Uh, we're not going to get the, not going to get that far. That's a little more complex, but we can access the native features of a device. And in this case, we're saying let's exit. Let's let's just quit the app, load it, remove it from memory. We're back to our device. Well, for the to start over, we're going to need something very similar. But then it moves us on our timeline back to the first frame of the first scene. So here's where we've got uh, maybe a little copy and paste. And again, the perils of copy and paste are that you have to copy and paste and change what is necessary. So I, I am going to do copy and paste. And we've got btn replay, add event listener, touch event, touch tap, fn go, um, title, go, no, start. Start is what our first. Our very first scene is fn go start. Therefore, the function that we are uh, going to define is fn go start. Our comment will be then player wishes to start over. Now, you could set it up that it goes back to the title screen, where then they can play the game or go to help. Or you could set it up that it goes directly back to the very first scene of a game, which is the gate. Either way that you want to do this will be fine. I will go back to the title. But either way, it'll be movie clip, go to and play somewhere. It'll be this route, the main timeline. We're going to go somewhere. Scene one, or frame one, comma, the name of the scene you want to go to. This is the part where then you can choose to go back to the title or just go straight, straight back to the first screen of the game. And I will go back to S, start. From there, they can choose to then play or go help. That should be enough to test it. Uh, you can save it and run it, check your spelling, go deliberately to the bad ending, 
try clicking the quit button, see if it shuts down the game properly, play it again, and then see if you um, replay the game. Let me check my own code first. Oops, I got an error. What's happening with mine? Uh, duplicate function definition. Um, go start. Um, no, from the help screen. Oh, from the help screen. Okay. No problem. Then what we'll do here? BTN replay. Go. Re go start replay. Or FN go replay. You know that that'll be fine. You know what? What we could even do. Hmm. We could do this also. We could leave it as. We, we could. What's that? I was gonna say. Since it's technically duplicate function definition, we have a function that take that will take us back to the beginning. We've defined that function somewhere already. We can use a function that has been defined elsewhere, actually. So I'm going to give this one a shot. This will probably work fine. More than one object can have an event listener to run the same function. That's like having seven sprites that you click on all give you a point. You don't have to make seven functions that give you one point. You make one function that gives you the point, and seven sprites have add event listener play that function. I forgot because it was a while ago um, that we did a function go start back on help. Well, we've already got a definition of a function that will take us back to frame one scene start. So I'm commenting it out just to confirm that it works. And if it does, it works. If it doesn't, then we will actually write a new one. But if it works, then we don't need a whole new function to do the same thing. We've already got a function that will take us back to start. But let me confirm it, because sometimes the logic of it, sometimes the syntax works, but not the logic. So let me test mine, see if that works. I'll go deliberately to the wrong, to the bad ending, and try to, try to, um, well, I'll do quit first, and then I'll do restart. I want to confirm if quit works. So my game starts. I play, open the gate, vandalism. Then I go into the right hallway. The creature's coming at me, really, really hungry. He's coming. I got me. I'm done with it. Quit. OK, I've got to check my quit in a moment. Replay. OK, I've got to check my replay. Did it work for anyone? It sent you to the gate scene. OK, yours is, your, yours is cursed. Uh, we're going to have to. <laughs> We're gonna have to figure that out in a moment, but let me check mine here. Uh, actually, let's take our first break. It's 2.40, take a break until 2.50. Let me just confirm my code, and then we'll go on in just a moment. We'll be back at 2.50.